this is just kind of an update and on the issues around Department of Corrections workforce because we had some some conversation the other day and I think that the, the two things that even though they aren't in any bills or anything but that we said we would kind of just keep an eye on and keep working around was this issue of Department of Corrections workforce and the whole issue of um, employee parking in the Capitol complex. Um, <laughs> we uh, we did have one session on that with BGS and our capital uh, security and a bunch of other people and we, they said they were going to come up with some suggestions in a couple of weeks so we're scheduling them just for an update next okay. week. So these are two issues that don't have legislation necessarily but that we really want to kind of keep an eye on and um, so I do not see Steve Howard here. Um, I do see Damien here. And um, you are here just to work with us if we come up with anything. Yep. And if you, need, if you do need to, to go someplace else, just we. OK, well, I, I told the committee upstairs that they could have me up three so that you guys would have time with me. But Whoa. I know they, they're trying to mark up a bill. They just, Who is it? House Commerce, so. <coughs> Is it a bill that we might like? <laughs> uh, it prohibits some non-compete agreements. So I don't know if that would be a bill you'd like or not. I don't know, but if you if you feel you'd, your time would be better spent up there helping them, feel free. OK. Yeah. I'll check in with the okay. assistant and see where they're at. OK. Thank you. So we're, we are having members of the DOC next week, too. So. Okay. Um, and then, um, so who who else is here that wants to weigh in today? Any? Any of you want to weigh in today on this thing? Where are you from? <laughs> I want to hear what their employment practice is. Where are you from? Oh, I'm just here to observe. Okay. Department of Labor. Oh, great. And yeah. 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 And so um, I was hoping that we would hear some more from the Employees Association. But um, And one of the things we talked about was how hard it is to recruit and why, why we can't fill positions and stuff. So I talked to Beth yesterday about maybe just talking to us a little bit about that. And do we really need to look at different qualifications and different what is it that we need to do in order to be able to recruit and retain people for DOC? Do you want to just join us in? And knowing that this is pretty informal, I think that we should just um, feel that we're. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure the Department of Labor has some information about why it might be hard and what they can do to work with with human resources and corrections and stuff. So. Okay. And at the end, may we ask other questions of the workforce report? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, um, if we have time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that, um, and we were, we were hoping that um, Commissioner Baker could come and give us kind of an update, but he could not come today. So, but we'd already scheduled everything. And texting. Getting hard to reschedule and unschedule and reschedule. So, anyway, so Commissioner, would you like to give us some information on that kind of what we talked about yesterday? That would be great. I'm Beth Fastigi, the Commissioner of Human Resources, and I also have um, our General Counsel Tom Oldman here, and then our Director of um, Field Operations, Chris McConnell, is also here to keep me uh, make sure I questions they usually know the answer so okay. <laughs> so we're at, they're there for support and as you all know um, DHR is a support department so we support um, all the state government and anything HR so I like to think of myself as the back operations of state government the back office of there and I have a uh, lot of uh, extensive business background so um, the things that we do we do payroll all payroll including your payroll 
Um, we do employee classification. We do benefits administration and wellness, st statewide training, uh, labor relations, um, field services. So our employees are kind of sit within the agencies and departments and provide them what you would think of as typical human resources services and personnel support and then also employee investigations into misconduct. That's kind of a broad range of the things we do. Also recruitment, uh, statewide recruitment. And as you know, Agency of Human Services is the largest agency in state government. Therefore, they're our biggest customer. I like to think of them as our biggest customer. And the largest single individual department is also the Department of the Corrections. Um, with DCF, they're kind of competing for, for a number of employees. But they're, the two are the right up there, kind of those big, big departments. And so I thought um, maybe it would be a good idea to kind of look at it at the macro level and look at the workforce report. And so I do have some copies of some things that I thought we could highlight in the report if you want it, but you also have it because it's so much nicer. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, it is. It's so much nicer online. You all have the link to it, but uh, I think is that enough for everybody? I have a couple other. One for Gail. Thank you. Can you show that? So, yeah. Um, and so, so I, the ones that I pulled up was just to kind of look at the size, look at the size of corrections, and there, this is alphabetical, it's got, um, it's, um, so corrections is kind of down, you know, 10 down, see, and they've got, um, total full-time equivalents, 977, and if you look kind of down the line, They've got the Agency of Transportation is there standing alone, but that's a whole agency. And then um, Children and Families is up there with um, a high number as well. So Children and Families is the 970 and Corrections is the 977. So they're kind of neck and neck for the largest departments. And then if you flip it over, it just is the historical. It just is going to give you those same tables historically. So it's gonna, you're going to see sorry, kind of a change. Yeah. Yeah. Beth, may I just ask you? The 977 is the number that they have allotted to them or the number of, uh, of people actually working actually at this very moment? This is the um, year end fiscal 19. So it's as of this is all June 30th, 2019 data. And it's actual, not actual, not budget. positions. Okay. Not positions, not budget. That's what they had on staff. So, the number of employees and full-time equivalents, which is different if they had a few part-time people. And do we? Uh, I mean, just because this is an interesting, as we look at retention and the challenge of recruiting in this department, do you have the number of that they are actually allotted? Um, that is in the workforce. I think the positions or number of positions is probably in the workforce report. I'm not sure that I printed that out. Okay. But that's a different number, correct? It is going to be the number. The Department of uh, Corrections has a significant number of vacancies. Right. Um, right now, um, without, the new it. without even the new positions, they have a significant number of vacancies. And that is one of the things that we... Right. Um, that I asked you if yes. any thought about how, why that is a priority, what we do about it. Yeah, thank you. So in the next time, and then the next one, it's just the department size over the years, um, the percentage change in number of um, people from 20, you know, from the past five years. All that information is also available online, the workforce report, and also in our open data um, on the DHR website, it goes back further if you're ever interested in going back. Then you flip it over to um, Table 14, which is the most populous classified job titles in the fiscal year. And as you can see in the top one is the Corrections Officer 1 at 339. And then shortly down below is uh, Corrections Officer 2 at 120. So those 459, that that is actually, you know, corrections officers one or two ones, you know, they're just different levels mm -hmm. of, you know, the twos have, you know, bigger job responsibilities and get paid more, but so 459 corrections officers, so it's clearly by far the most populous job title in state government. Yeah. Um, so, well, does that mean just the, the biggest number? Yeah, it's okay. just, I'm just trying to give you kind of the scope of corrections yep. 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 and kind of level set of what it is. And then it's the next one, next page, table 28. Uh, hired by department by fiscal year. And that's when you start looking at how many people uh, they're hiring Department of Corrections and it's starting to get into that turnover. Yeah. Um, so the number of hires and corrections that they hired in 2019 was 165. And if you look at that, that is um, by far the number, highest number. 
um, transportation comes in second at 140. And, so, and the 16.8 is a, a, a percent of the whole, or is it the percent of the retention? It's percent of the whole. Yes. What's 16.8 percent of? Well, I'm I'm looking at that, and um, I've got to figure that out because looking back, I don't see how. I think it's a percentage of the whole. It's a percentage. Of the whole. It's a percentage of the whole. Yeah, mm -hmm. a, it must be. Yes. Retention is even higher than that. So. Yeah. So if you look over turnover by fiscal year on the next page, it's got some. Um, there's two next two pages are really on turnover. The highlighted in oh, highlighted in um, orange is the ones that kind of have a higher turnover than the general uh, state population, and then in in the uh, blue is the lower turnover, lower level of turnovers. And you can see from the. Um, Department of Corrections traditionally has a higher level of turnover. You know, some departments vary depending on the year and retirements and stuff, but pretty much, as you can see, a high level of turnover building and building and building over the past uh, five years. Yeah, the past four years. Maybe. Yeah. It's grown considerably. Yeah. So that just gives you kind of an idea. You also look at places like 20 other 24-hour facilities like the Department of Mental Health. They have the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. They've got a pretty high turnover. Um, Vermont Veterans Home, I'm guessing, pretty pretty high turnover, especially with the shortages of nursing. So you can look at that. Well, actually, it's gone down at the Veterans Home. Yeah. And it's only gone up in mental health 2%. Yeah. So I would say you know, we have a much more serious, this is beginning to identify the problem. Yeah. And then if you look at, we've got the, um, this is just for 2019. This interesting chart just geographically depicted kind of which departments in general have high turnover rates and um, I have a, corrections is right up there and you see some of the smaller departments up there might be um, like public service and lottery commission those are likely more you know those are small departments so it just it, it fluctuates a lot more but when you see um, veterans home corrections up there um, it, it's 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 expected but it's kind of good to see it geographically um, depicted I think I think it's helpful mm -hmm. And then I also, the next one, next page is um, table 36. It's just um, turnover rates by classified job titles. So you look at the corrections officer one, it's 32.5%. Uh, 32, 32 Some of those are, I believe, going into the correction officer two position. But, um, you know, as a, and the correction officer two position, those are the more experienced and, um, you know, they don't have as high a turnover rate. Um, Mental health specialist isn't doing much, I and mean, it's worse. Yep. So corrections isn't the only problem, isn't the only um, department where we struggle with turnover. And then, wow. Table 39 is another uh, turnover one where it looks at, um, talks about where the turnover comes from, which is a little, kind of breaking it down a little bit more. And when you look at corrections, voluntary terminations are 13.3%. Involuntary is a 1.1 for total turnover. That's when you get the 18.6%. Then you also look at employee movement. Um, that's moving from one department into another. So if a correction employee moves to another department, it's going to be, it's still movement, but it's not, we're still retaining that person in state government. So the investment that we've made is still, you know, stays there. So we just wanted to look at that and add that in. So we've got a total department outflow there. So, so when you look at, like, so let's look at the agency of administration. The total turnover is low up top there, but employee movement is 16%. So people are moving for a total outflow of 24%, but a lot of those people that are in the agency of administration may move to another place in state government. So if you look at like the Department of Finance and Management tax, there's some there's opportunities for those folks in other departments in state government working in finance in those organizations. So you're going to see some crossover there. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not always necessarily a bad thing. Um, then this is a kind of the final one of the final so, indicators. Just, oh yeah, it's interesting that the the, the highest turnover in corrections is voluntary I mean, right that, that says something that there uh, and it's much higher than any place else in the voluntary turnover except for mental health is 
up there. Yeah. But, yeah. I've also noticed on a couple of these, the Secretary of State's offices, particularly, uh, why would, I, I don't understand why um, that might be. Uh, I, I'm not happy with it. I know that we stole a yeah, I, I we stole an employee from the Secretary of State's office a couple years ago, but then she she was an attorney and she was in our firm for a year and she was fantastic, but then she moved to Colorado. But um, so we stole a lot of them. It's okay. a small department as well, so that is that so we, one or two affect the average. They can department. affect the average, but you know you may want to talk to the Secretary okay. Condos about it. Management style. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, is, just kidding. Yes. Do you, uh, Beth? Do you include involuntary? Um, well, you have retired. Yes. But that's pretty low. So, if if they were voluntarily sort of choosing to retire early, with that would be re that would if they're eligible for retirement, retirement benefits. They'd show up and retire. But if. You know, if you worked there for five years and you're vested, that doesn't, and it's not going to count as a retirement. Someone's going to be leaving with some type of a retirement benefit. So this is voluntary and not staying in state government. Yes. Yeah. Right. I quit. Yep. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, but once you're in the state employee's system, you know, you, the, well, you can't retire you until you're eligible to retire. No, that's not what I meant. I mean, what I mean is you're walking away from all of that. You're not going elsewhere. Well, I think that's one thing that I look at. Um, that's our retirement system. It really it encourages longevity. Yes. But that's not um, that's not what um, many younger people are mm -hmm. looking for when they're starting a new job. They're looking for something else. I'm not thinking about that benefit. So once you've been in for a while, I think I have this many years, and I got to stay. You know, if I stay five more. I can get full retirement, and that's really great. But to, that's not something that's really gonna keep the newer, younger worker there. It's not enough of an incentive. It may not yeah. be enough, but I have two. I have a 30-year-old, and I have a 26-year-old, and both of them are really proud of their retirement benefits that they have, and speak about them, which stuns me. Some of us are well, well past our retirement age, and we never did anything that turned us. Positively about it. And it's a local society. People will follow Yeah, time. I never thought exactly. we'd get old. Yeah. And well, we're, we're also working really uh, hard with um, the treasurer's office to really promote not just talking about the um, defined benefits and defined contribution plans, but also to talk about savings and the um, yeah. 457B plan and the benefits of that. So we've been working really hard. Um, we have a lot of. Um, there's always an update in the DHR monthly newsletter, the HR Connect newsletter that goes out that encourages people to, um, you know, participate in retirement seminars or savings seminars. And we also have in our employee wellness um, incentive program, like people will get points for uh, participating in a retirement center seminar or doing a doing a activity that that is related to financial well-being. And our employee assistance program also does uh, financial consulting too. So there are, there are a lot of resources. Um, and I think that uh, one of the important things to do as a leader is to really educate newer employees and educate employees about saving for retirement and the importance of it yeah. and being financially, financially, uh, you know, financially, looking at those things financially. So, yeah. And then uh, beyond turnover, um, cash overtime by departments. Um, I've got the you know the four year, four or five years, and then I have also the change in fiscal year. So you look at there and the corrections that can highlight there. They do have the um, highest dollar amount overtime. Oh, all, yeah. oh, just think of how many employees we could hire for that. Of all state, of all state um, agencies and departments. Um, and the change is increased this year by 20%. So if you look at the, um, just in the next one, is kind of a little, another one of the pictorial graphs. Wait, is it change? Can I just ask a question? Yeah. What's the, uh, I mean, isn't overtime overtime? What's cash overtime versus what other overtimes are there? You can, um, I say you work, extra hours you can also get comp time for those oh, okay so, so if you're going to put those for comp time to say you're also um, a newer employee that doesn't have a lot of vacation you just like to take a lot of time off you can put those for towards comp um, in corrections um, they um, 
I think a lot of it gets, most of it probably gets paid out by, I didn't take the comp overtime there, but comp overtime is not their big thing. I mean, they're getting a lot of cash overtime because it's hard for them to take time off. I was going to so say, in a department where you're right. so short-staffed, it's hard to take comp overtime because somebody... And, and I'm not sure, I don't even know, I mean, maybe Mr. Howard knows, but I'm not sure of the um, corrections contract, how much cash or if it's if the default, I think the default for them is cash, cash. over time. They may have the ability to ask for a comp of time. So uh, the other thing that would be interesting to know is what percent of the corrections of the 977 or whatever that number was yeah. at the beginning, what percent are doing, are, are you, are, are overtime are you are using overtime i mean what percent of the 977 are of the employees yes are. well i would say at least 459 of them corrections office that are in the facilities are probably all having to have a use of overtime if they're so over know, 400 of the 977 yeah so i'm i'm yeah. I, you know any of those i mean they have mandatory overtime in, in the facilities so they're all working from what i understand a lot of overtime yeah. Yeah. No, the, the images of these people sleeping in the parking lot because they only have four hours between shifts is a little startling. And I do. And then the next three pages, pages are just all key metrics by department. You can look at age, male, female, minority percentage. So those are just all there, and I just thought those would be kind of good to look at. But this is, of course, my annual plug for all the information in the workforce report. You have a link to it. So if you have questions on that or if you want more data, we um, love to work on that. We love to present that. It's one of the best reports in state government, I think, because it really just gives, gives everybody a big picture of what's happening in each organization and some of the statistics. So it's a, it's a good tool. So what data in it are you most proud of? What data am I the most proud of? Ooh. Yeah, as the director, of, you know, as the yeah. HR director for the state, what data are you most proud of? What data am I most proud of? Um, I want to point out actually something that I'm not saying that I'm proud of or not proud of. It's um, looking on, I didn't print this out, it's on, um, it's table 31 on page 37. And it's just, it is, it's an overall turnover and a historical turnover table. So if you do have an iPad that I can show you, but. This year, in 2019, my iPad. Okay. we have the highest number of level of employee turnover that we've had since 2016, 17, when we had the retirement incentive. But without that retirement incentive, which we didn't have, it's right up there. So this, this right now where we are, that employee turnover is driven by retirements primarily, and it's. You know, as the baby boomers age and as people are aging, we are continuing to see that um, retirements grow. And with you know not as many people entering the workforce, the workforce challenges that we're seeing in state government are reflective of um, you know the overall workforce. So I just think that that's a very um, or table 31, it's, it's page 43 of 86. No, it's page 37. Well, it's page 37 here, but in online. On, online, it's table, you said yeah. table 31? 31, yeah. It said it's on page Mine says, 43. Yeah. On the, it's of the PDF. It's, but it's you're both right. 30, you're, page you're right. You're both right. Page. Page. Okay. Isn't that nice? I love it when I share that with you. They are right. So, so I just thought that, that that graph is very telling to me about just the kind of the characteristics of the workforce. It's not, it's it's kind of, it is what it is. It's not, I'm just, I just think that it's a very interesting statistic. And for our human resources, when we think about how we're going to staff and what we're going to do going forward, just the whole state government, not specifically corrections, but what, what things can we to do to, to attract um, employees to our workforce. What are the what are the things that drive people? Is it the infants in the workplace program? Is that helping? Is that you know what other things do people want? We have um, you know we do have a work at home program. Are people taking advantage of that? Are are appointing authorities encouraging that in the workforce? Or are they thinking no? I want everybody here on my desk. So. And is that a reason why somebody moves from one department to that? Oh, if I work in that department, I can work at home two days a week, and that works better for me. I don't have to use the commute. I don't have to waste gas on the commute. I don't have to waste time. I don't have to um, you know, better for the environment. I don't have to wait to stay in my pajamas. Whatever, whatever 
it makes people excited about <laughs> working. So, so are, are there tables here that reflect those accomplishments that, of programs and benefits and opportunities you put in place? That's not really, that's not in the yeah. workforce report. That's more in our budgetary report. A lot of that stuff's in our And budget where report. is employee satisfaction? That, that, we do the, an employee engagement survey. Uh, that's, that's not different. That's different than, the, um, and that's available online. I didn't bring that today. But it talks about one of the things we did this year with that is we did an overall engagement score. So that talked about um, kind of different levels of employee engagement. And one of the things that we really found is because state government is really about serving the public, some of those people that are really um, in very high mission-oriented departments, you can tell by the overall engagement score that they just love their jobs and they love what they do and they're very interested in you know their niche whatever that is and so that's one of the benefits we have in state government is we are serving the public so it is service and it drives people if people are mission driven they want to come work for they may want to come work for state of vermont so that's one of the things we kind of promote on our website um, about in our recruitment website is um, Kind of the mission and what's the mission and how you're how you're serving Vermonters and that's very um, that can be very attractive to young people and especially in jobs like that or some of the science jobs that they have like the state geologist or something you know if you're you can be the whatever it is you know the, the only state geologist. right exactly um, so just going back right. then to just the whole corrections thing what do we do about the turnover and the um, Hi, Damien. Thank you. Um, I mean, clearly there's some issues there. We know that it's a probably a horrible job, and I, I mean, not a horrible job, a really hard job, a really hard job with a lot of pressures. And what are you coming back, Steve? Yes, I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I really want us to have a conversation about what kinds of things can can we do do we why have why haven't we been able to fill those positions that they're already approved to fill and um and i can speak I, about that on a kind of a very high level about um what we've done to help corrections and what corrections have done themselves so the first thing they've done is they now have just um created two new positions um uh, which are full-time recruiters which are working with the Department of Human Resources recruiters and how to recruit differently and how to have just better, best recruitment practices. So those are two new jobs within corrections that they have created in the past. Um, it's been the works for a while, but the two people are just on board. So our team, we have um, two full-time recruiters in Department of Human Resources, and those are, you would think we've, we would have had those for a long time, but that's actually very new for the Department of Human Resources to actually have actual professional recruiters that are helping departments, you know, write the job descriptions so that they're attractive. How do, you, how do you interview? What's the onboarding process? So really guiding managers on through that hiring process rather than in the past we really were focused on entering the job into the system. It was more just about the process and the system going forward. It really wasn't about how to recruit the best people and where to recruit the best people. So between our new online recruitment software as well as having the recruiters and changing the way we've done recruitment. We've seen a lot of um, changes um, from departments and the, um, I think the feedback from departments is about how helpful that is. So we're helping bring that model to corrections mm -hmm. where it was more, you know, it might not be helpful to just go and sit at a table at a job fair. That's just not how you're going to recruit people. I don't know. So it's it's how do you make, how do you promote that through social media? How do you how do you talk to people? Where should we be going on talking to people? So I mean, it partly could relate to one of the things that was mentioned in here is that there are fewer applicants per job availability for the state, mm -hmm. and the number of applicants is going down. Mm -hmm. Part that relates to lower employment, there are fewer people looking for I'm not saying there's a lot of good jobs around, but, but just in general, yeah. there are fewer, fewer people looking for jobs. So if this is a particularly difficult job to handle, you know, right. logically you're going to see fewer people applying. Exactly, and if people are, you know, in that, and if people are leaving because there's other opportunities for them, or maybe they didn't have one because, um, you know, the, the 
qual we, what we do is we train the people, train the people to be the corrections officers. You can't normally go to a school to be a corrections officer. There's not a degree in it, so it really needs to be on the job training. So you know, if you have the aptitude and and the desire, we can train you to do that. But there's a lot of jobs like that, so there's a bit, there's opportunities for both of those people elsewhere too. So. Um, I think we have maybe a couple different things we have. First of all, what are the qualifications that we need for the, the jobs? And then the, how do you recruit for those jobs? And then once you've recruited, how do you retain those jobs? Because you can make a, a, a recruitment sound really wonderful, and then you get there and you say, oh my god, I've got to work 32 hours today? Uh, I, I mean, so we need to figure out then what what are the qualifications that you need to have to be in these positions because maybe we have that wrong, and then recruiting them, and then how do you retain them once you have people there because we can see by the turnover that we aren't doing a very good job of retaining, and I, I, I don't know where we go with that. And what I really like to do is just kind of have a, a conversation and get VSEA in on this and Department of Labor and just in, just have this conversation so that we can figure this out. Because in issues like this, this is my personal bias coming out here, but in issues like this, it seems to me that we don't ever get really where we want to go when we have somebody testifying and then somebody else testifying and then somebody else testifying and instead having a general conversation about about where we go and what the issues are. So I, I think you're right. I think it would be great to have a dialogue because I think all these things lead to leadership. You have all these problems when you have poor leadership. So if leadership is not strong in corrections, you're going to end up with exactly where we are. Uh, it's culture and leadership. As I have listened in the last month and a half on this issue, culture and leadership. If you're recruiting from the National Guard and there's a poor culture there that's being passed on to the poor culture and creating and fostering more poor culture, culture and leadership. So I think I'd love to have all three of you address culture and leadership and how we change it. And I think Jim Baker is off to, uh, it sounds like a, a productive start, but it, he's not staying with us beyond April. So that's heartbreaking because he's done such a great job in so many places in state government and, and in municipal government. So I, am going to, I am going to say, though, that I think that it's, it's more than just leadership because you, uh, I think, um, and I may be wrong here, but I, I thought Andy Polito was making some good moves. I think uh, Mike Touchette was moving. No? Okay. I, this is from my experience in judiciary and working on corrections issues, and, and they didn't so there's more than you have to have good leadership, but you also have to have the right conditions so that that leader, because if you, if you, you could have the best leader in the world, but if you don't have the people in the positions where they should be, and you, and you're, I mean, uh, uh, the leadership isn't, they're still going to have to work overtime. We need, they need to have, we need to make, we may need to make some real systemic changes, and that isn't, Yep. And, and part of that is the, the funding, part of it is um, how we, the, so it isn't, I, I just wanted to go on record saying that I think that it isn't, it isn't that we have had really bad leadership. I think we've had, um, we've had people who in different positions that may not have been in the best position they could have been, but um, I, I will go on the record saying I think that Mike Touchette was making some really, really important changes with the corrections. Um, and, and, and there's an inmate population and then there's the employee population and you have to make the changes with both of those. So I, yes. I tend to agree. I think there are certain occupations that if you're miscast as an employee, you immediately have a situation. So that speaks to a recruiting issue where you almost have to line people up so that they know what to expect in the job. And some people just would not be comfortable or particularly effective in that job. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I take 
officiating as a poor example, but if you can't take getting yelled at, then don't put the shirt on. Yeah. It, it's really sometimes that simple. And we have, we have made changes in our correction system over the years so that we now have the same, I think, issue in corrections that we have in our um, psychiatric hospitals. The acuity level of the people who are there is much higher. It is a much more demanding job than it has ever been because the people who, we have reduced our prison population from where it would have been if we had followed the same trajectory, it would have been 2,700. We're now at 1,700. So those 1,000 people are in pe state. No, that's our incarcerated population. That's in our incarcerated population. Our 200 out of state. Yes, that's our incarcerated population, 1,700. And, and the Department of Corrections works with, with the people out of state as well. So they're part of our population. But so, um, so the people that are there now are a much different group of people for the, the corrections officers that are, that are working in the prisons. And we have to acknowledge that and maybe change the way we think about who corrections officers are and how we deal with them. It's a very different population now. I think it's a complex problem. It is. And I, I think it's going to take a totally systemic, a systemic change to, and I agree, I think you can have a good leader with a lousy culture and that undermines leadership. On the other hand, great leadership tends to, over time, right all those challenges. And I, uh, one of our challenges in corrections is we have not had consistent leadership for a long stretch of time. It's a tough job and people burn out. Uh, we, you know, people move on. We have not been able to keep our, our uh, heads of corrections. And I don't know what the turnover rate is for the heads of each prison itself, you know, for the leadership per prison. But I, you know, it would be interesting to see what those are. I think it's a tough, tough job. But I think it all works together. But I think I'm the daughter of management. I, you know, so I actually do believe most things come from the vision and the leadership at the top. And uh, that is... But it is clearly a systemic change we have to make in corrections to to uh, serve Vermont Vermonters. Our right. Inmates. So what are those corrections that we need those and changes the, that, we, yeah. that we need to make? I think that that's um, right. So do we have the right qualifications for the right people? I mean, are have the jobs changed enough that we're still using a a, a qualifications and a definition of the job? from 1970. Do we need to change that? Do we need to look at how we reimburse corrections officers? It, and mainly you're talking about the corrections officers, I think, in the prisons, right? Where the biggest problem is, not in the field staff. Is that right, Steve? Well, there's, uh, there's two different fronts. So, so Just to identify yourself. Steve Howard, the executive director of the SBA. There is a, we're talking about the culture in general. Right. There is one thing you'll see in the, in, it's very clear in the DHR in, uh, engagement uh, survey. Is there's a massive disconnect between central office and the facilities and the field. The two do not exist in the same plant. And uh, there's a lot of resentment by frontline workers of central office. Central office meaning Locker. the commissioner's office. Yeah. yeah. But there's, it's not, I mean, there's a lot of people in central office, but I mean, there's... there's well, yeah. So I would say there's two yeah. problems. There's, yeah. There is yeah, the, all like, of the issues that are happening in the facilities, some of the issues you've, you've talked about. There is a feeling among our members, I think, that one positive thing the legislature could do is review every single exempt per person who works in central office, figure out where they came from, how they got there, and what they do. Because that's a mystery to a lot of people in the, in the, what they do is sometimes a mystery to a lot of people in, in the field. And how they got there is they're often superintendents who needed to be moved. So for instance, Jennifer Spratsky is another superintendent who, was, who mentioned the seven days article that started this stuff. They were the superintendents who presided over this facility during that time period. They both work in central office. So our members say, well, I'm on TRD, then I'm in trouble. Why does management keep moving people around? Why do they keep landing in central office? 
So that's part of it. And then there's the, the, there's the idea, I think, that the, over, the vacancies come from, for some people, it's not the right job. Mm -hmm. But and the standards used to, the hiring standards used to take a test to be a correctional officer. You don't take a test anymore. And I, I remember I asked Mike Touchette, Mr. Touchette, where he was going to fill those 30 positions first that you approved last year. And he said, anywhere I can find someone. <laughs> and, he, and he wasn't lying, he was just being honest. Mm -hmm. um, that's not how you want to do it. Uh, so the overtime is the biggest driver of the reason people leave, the life, the life work balance, the, the, the difficulty of being exhausted and having the most difficult offenders you've ever had, the most violent offenders you've ever had to, to supervise. But then there's all these other things that come down. From, they, our members see it from central office. Some of it comes from the legislature to central office. We're asking too much from the system as it exists today. They don't have the resources to do what the legislature wants done. And part of that you saw in the, in the justice reinvestment report. Corrections has been level funded for many, many years. And the, the, that really essentially ends up cut because costs keep going up. So we are in a mess because of that. Um, it's it's, um, it's going to cost more to get the correction system the legislature wants. And it's not just that we have to pay people more money and we have to do things like provide child care because they are ordered over all the time and they're going to leave to get their kid if today the school closes. You can't tell a mother or a father, a single mother or a single father or any parent, that their kid's going to have to sit in a snowstorm somewhere because they can't find somebody to pick their kid up. Our members are disciplined when they do that. They refuse an order. So we've got to, if we, if we want the correction system that the legislature wants, it's going to cost more money. But you have to be more specific, for me anyway, I don't know about anybody else, but you have to be more specific because we're asking too much and it's been level funded and that is true and the number of people in beds has gone down so you don't want to fund, you don't want to fund it at, if we have 1,700 people now and Justice Reinvestment is in this very first round they're looking at decreasing the number of beds 106 to 135. So you don't want to, you don't want to budget for 1,700 if you're going to have 1,550. I mean, so you have to, uh, so you have to be more specific about what the changes are. For me, anyway, I don't know about anybody else in here, but you have to be more specific about what the, what the, what we're asking too much of the system. What, what is it? Is it that we don't have the proper uh, space? We don't have the proper uh, programming. What, what is it exactly? Huh? Well, I'll give a good example, I think, from our member's okay. perspective. Yeah. Uh, the, the medically assisted treatment program. Yes. It, it has been, an, uh, from our member's perspective, a complete failure and disaster. Which treatment program? Medically assisted treatment. Mm -hmm. And partly it's because they were not consulted in how to implement it, or whether it should be implemented, or how the discussion never included them. And yet they're the ones who have to stand there for three hours while people go through the med lines. And they're the ones that have to be there at 3 in the morning and work overtime for a program that has left them without any, there's positions in the correctional facilities called floats, mm -hmm. who are there to yeah. basically relieve people at different posts. And the most important thing for our members that float does is they come and react. They come and help when there's an emergency, when there's, when there's uh, uh, an attempt by, by inmates to overtake a, a a wing, for instance, floats would come in and help right. reinforce. The floats were all on the med line. So they're not getting breaks. So that, that's a good example of, of a program that I think was well intentioned. But because we don't have the staff resources to do it, we have uh, created an atmosphere in which people um, don't want to work in the department anymore. So, how would you have changed the MAT program? I would have started very small. Like with who? Very short. First of all, I would have, I think the Colonel Baker said it this morning, uh, he said it in a panel last night. There was a panel last night that yeah. he it, which I, I emailed Dan and said, it's a great panel. You have nobody on that panel who's ever worked in a Vermont correctional facility. 
was and Tuesday night. Tuesday night. It was the fourth. And okay. that's that's the problem. We are talking about corrections reform. We're talking about all these things without talking about the people who actually are doing the work. We're talking to people up here from Ohio and New York and wherever, but not from the people who go to work every day in those facilities. And what you hear is completely, the worlds are completely different. Right. So go back to MAT. How would? So I think the way the commissioner started it, Commissioner Menard started it, was was maybe the best way to start it. Very small, last six months of your sentence. If you were going, you were you were prepared to go back out into the world, and then you could have expanded it as you addressed the staffing crisis, as you got people, as you filled the positions, and you kept people there for longer than six months or two years. You actually got the overtime rates down. Then you expand that program. And, and I think we were asking too much of the corrections system with the staffing levels we had to actually be able to implement that program. And so somebody had to, I think what, one thing that makes our members upset is that, and I, I try to tell them, the commissioner did try to tell the legislature no. And it's hard to tell the legislature no. But it's, it was not a program the, the, the corrections department at that time or now can do or could do. It seems like you're never going to be able to do new programs or creative programs or systemic right. change in the programs if you don't have the people to do the work. It doesn't make any sense. You're just going to keep moving people yeah. around. And something that may be really nice to do may ultimately be good. It's going to fail because people are doing it are, are burned out. Yeah, I also think there's a, so there's a, that feeling of not being listened to, of people not understanding what the real world is like. And then there's the sense with this population that it's very difficult to manage, mm -hmm. that they don't have the tools to maintain order. So that goes to training. No, it goes to. And resources. Training. Well, it's that, it's training, it's resources. Um, it's knowing that if you make a decision to use force, the management's going to support you. Um, and if you need to send someone to segregation, which is a tool that our members feel is very effective, you're going to be permitted to do that. Excuse me, one second. I'm in a little trouble with my throat. So, oh, do, so you I need keep some, coming back. do you need a cup no, of water? No, I'll be right back. Uh, but I think it, oh, let me just go. Right, I'll come right back. <laughs> Department of Corrections budget is? What was presented in the governor's budget? I have no idea. It's over 200 billion, right? <clears throat> I don't know. I think it is. I think that's what I vaguely remember. When I came in here in 2005, it was 89 million. Just when he talks about level funding, it has grown like topsy, that budget. That budget has grown faster than any other budget I've watched in state government. So uh, while we're waiting for Steve, I can just talk about a few other things that um, that we're trying to do to assist corrections and some things that tools that we have that we haven't had as much in the past. Um, the new uh, we uh, in the past probably three years they got a learning management system that was a lot of online system that can track employee training. You can upload online courses. We just bought. Um, online, a whole suite of online learning software that's available to all state employees. So one good thing about that is, I mean, people still need to do on the job and classroom training, but if you want to push out a new training, like, okay, everyone's going to look at this sexual harassment prevention training refresher, you can push that out and assign it to everybody and they can all do it in a month and everyone can get it done. So I think that's something that um, just having that system and having the um, broad course content, which is more generic in nature, but it has it has those things that they can assign and employees can do, um, you know, so employees can do that. So that's a, just a positive thing that I think is can help. It's not gonna, it's not a, certainly, it's just a little bit of something that can help the culture, but it's a tool that's provided and it's available now. Um, so I know, <laughs> poor Steve was sorry. So I just wanted to yeah. say something about the, the MAT program and how can I just say one thing quick I, I eat something that I'm clearly allergic to and my throat closes up so I may have to keep running back and in and out oh. I'm fine right now <laughs> well that was very silly of you I don't know what I ate but my throat keeps closing up so when it happens I'll leave but <laughs> I, I'm an epic happy you, to follow you in case no. you yeah, do we, yeah. Yeah. No, it happens don't go to the bathroom and pass out it's, it'll be probably fine it'll, it'll pass eventually so okay. I, we I have start of... foaming at the mouth that's why it's happened <laughs> Thank you well, for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the medical 
thing is right behind right me there. there. Mm, that I'll white thing. That's <laughs> that, um, it happens every once in a while. So the, I, I think that some of the problem is the lack of uh, clearly communicated um, goals that might come from the legislature to the administration and to the employees. My understanding of the MAT program was that if you are on an MAT um, when you're in the community and you're arrested, we will continue that when you come into the system because you don't want to stop people right, right away. So when, so then by implementing it so that it didn't happen that way, it was the last six months of your stay, you got to do that to prepare you to go back, then all these people are saying, well, wait a minute, I, I deserve to have it too because I was having it in the community before or I need it now and it just blossomed. So over half the population right. now, I believe, is on the MAT program. If you don't want to get sent to Mississippi, you find a way to get on the MAT program. Right. Well, and, 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 and so we have we have we have inmates who are sentenced have life sentences who weren't on uh, they've been in jail for five or six years they were clean they're now on the MAT program they they didn't have a problem but now they have they have a drug that's been provided to them by the state yep. they didn't need it but they knew how to answer the questions so they wouldn't be right. sent to Mississippi and that's the kind of stuff that I think that, that a correctional officer will know that somebody in central office may not know, somebody in the state house may not know, and somebody from New York, Ohio, wherever, whoever's on the panel may not know. But somebody who's in front of an offender every single day, they will know. And they'll know why people are doing what they're doing. And the things they're seeing are in the prisons that are related to the MIT program, I think, are disturbing to them. Yeah. So I think we have to rethink some of that stuff and say, OK, we have a staffing crisis. We can't fill these positions. Uh, in some ways, I do what Senator Carson said is right. It, a lot of it is leadership. And I think you'll see one thing I would look at. I, I haven't looked at this because these exempt employees, but I would look at the turnover in the superintendents. That's yeah. quite rapid in many places. Yeah. Where we have some of the biggest problems. Springfield, I was just there yesterday. Yeah. I met with a bunch of our members who are, they are just, they've had it. And that's position, that, that facility has the highest amount of overtime. Turnover in superintendents is like, it's a revolving door. And why is that? Well, it is a one of the toughest prisons. It's where some of the more difficult offenders are found. But I think the department's very political. And it's hard to, um, it, it is a, it's hard to maneuver. So it's not just the culture in the facilities, it's the management culture. Yeah. And it, it's got to be looked at. Well, that sets the vision and the tone and the value. Yeah. I'm sorry. Good leader sets all those yeah. things. It's, it's that. It's, you know, our members are willing to do what they were, they were not resistant to change. So the department testified last year in the House that one of the problems with the MAT program was just that philosophically our members, PSEA members, don't agree with it. That's not true. I mean, there, there are some members who don't agree with it philosophically. But it was, it was an example of, you're asking us to do something that we don't have the resources to do, and uh, you didn't bother to even ask us what we thought about it when you implemented it. And I think that's part of the problem. So it's the management culture, and what is central office doing? Who are all those people up there? And why do they not seem to understand what's happening up here? And then it's also the added, the added stress that you, I think, point to, Madam Chair, of the most difficult offenders we've ever had at the same time, without, without all of the tools you need to maintain order. And I think I, there is, it's clearly there's a role for social work in a facility and in the field. Probation and parole officers, the case managers, that help people plan for re-entry. They do serve a role as social workers. But, and, and our members will, are willing to be trained to do whatever you want them to do, but the number one priority of a correctional officer is to maintain the safety and security of that facility. 
And if they don't, either they're going to get hurt or, or get killed, yeah. or other inmates are going to get hurt and get killed. And so they can't do that and social work at the same time. You're going to have to supple. You're going to have to supplement that with another group of case managers, more social workers, if you want it. But you need to have people maintaining safety and security because that is their first priority. So, so we need to have. Do we, are the qualifications the right qualifications that we have for a corrections officer? Is the training the appropriate training? And 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 I hear you saying that um, we if. If a correction officer decides to use force or seclusion or whatever it is, that that's, that's the decision and they should be backed up. But there also has to be um, some accounting for why they did it. I don't think that you can just say, if a correction officer uses force, so be it, that's the way it is. You have to have some oversight of that, so there has to be some looking at it because otherwise, I mean, because, and I'm not saying that our corrections officers are bad, but there could be some rogue people out there. And, that, and we need to make sure that those decisions are the right decisions. So how do we, how do we balance that? I, I think that training and de escalation, uh -huh. I think, and our members would say that they, um, Especially the more seasoned ones, those the more experienced ones. You know, they are they want things to be done the right way. They want things to be implemented the way they should be implemented. And and they will work with younger correctional officers to help them get there. And the training I think is really important. And it's a lot of complicated training. I don't know if anyone's ever looked at PREA, but PREA is like Prison Rape Elimination Act is one example of it. It is a ton of training, it is a ton of requirements, and then you've got all you know, you've got a lot of other stuff on top of it. Um, they they don't they don't want things done improperly, even with the use of force. But if if in their professional judgment they need to do that, or they need tools like seclusion to maintain order, um, they want management to support them and to say, yep, yeah, you're the guys on the front line. And you're the ones that know what works, and we're going to support that. I, I think that's important, but I also think there needs to be a check on that because you can't yeah. just have that's people. Um, so there has to be some. Yeah. I mean, we I see the same thing in the mental health. Yeah, I think our members would agree with you, Chair. They, they do think there should be everything should be within reason, but they. What uh, we had a commissioner at a labor management meeting, and it's just a conversation back and forth. You know, when when the the seasoned folks, there's two things that I remember from this meeting. There was two or three people there who were 25 year, 30 year veterans in Department of Corrections. And they were talking about what they thought needed to be happening, needed to happen in the facilities. And the commissioner said, well, that's not what the research shows. And I said to him afterwards, do you realize how insulting that is to somebody who's worked in a prison for 30 years? That you think a professor in Ohio knows more about it than he does? And he left that meeting deflated, thinking, I've been working here for 30 years. And they're not listening. And you're not listening. You're saying this person in Ohio, who's in a very nice professor, you know, research lab, is telling you that, telling is, is having more influence on you as the commissioner than I am. And I've been standing in front of offenders for 30 years. So that's one thing. And then the other thing, in that same meeting, members were told, we need to use incentives. You can't use anything that's no, there should be no stick, it should be all carrot. And our members who work in these facilities said, it, that does not work. That is not a successful strategy. And we're telling you that, that, well, that's what the research shows. And I think we've got too much carrot, not enough stick, and that there does have to be a balance. I think that's, those are the two things I remember from that meeting. I felt so badly for that guy, because I thought, oh my god. And, and I don't think the commissioner meant to do that, but that was the effect. Saying, you know, 30 years of this doesn't matter. This person in Ohio knows more than you're doing. So I think that's a good example of how people feel and why they don't want to work there. Well, it, it also sounds like um, what I hear you saying is that we need to recruit. I mean, if, if leadership is one of our big challenges and the perpetuation of a, a non healthy culture, which is, sounds like it's sadly embedded in this department, it sounds like maybe we need to do some recruiting of leadership out from out of central office, from outside, from outside, 
I mean, we need, it sounds like we need, uh, you know, it sounds like we need hopefully a new commissioner who will be outside our system and come into it sort of the way Jim Baker has with fresh eyes, new eyes, no preconceived, you know, really ready to take on the whole system and, and work with HR to redesign it because, you know, there, there must be press practice, there must be successful prisons around the world, not necessarily in the United States, but around the world that we can look to that will provide us with much better models on how to do this better. This is not rocket science. This is, you know, we have, you know, one of the things I was, just a simple thing, but a major thing, that we traded a good road up to the Springfield prison for a workforce development training building is heartbreaking. We have all those people there now that are not learning any new skills. There's no workforce development CTE center, which there was supposed to be at that facility. They spent all the money on engineering that damn road. Well, you know, that we don't have, that we aren't, if we're, we have, you know, one of the things I see is we desperately also need them to feel like they're learning new skills, developing skills, being able to. You're talking about the stuff. prisoners. You're not talking about the employees. That's true. They, I am. There's, there's two. But there, there really are two but, sets of people here that you're serving. But there are two parts of the culture, and they, one part needs to feel like they're actually progressing towards lives being corrected. It, yes, but sometimes I think those two yeah. are at odds because because we can put lots of programming in place for the prisoners, and if we don't put right. if we don't well, we need teach, fine we, leadership for the for the for the I, I mean, we, we need to have we need the employees to be in a culture that they feel is safe and respected. Because yeah. so if we have wonderful programs for um, get ready to push the button. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Brian. Well, I'm sorry, he left. Yeah, he he'll might, be back. He, I know, but he might agree, and I don't want to take issue necessarily, but just suggest there's an alternative method. And I've seen this work backwards. When you bring someone from the outside, there are certain advantages, certain benefits that you get, and you mentioned fresh eyes. But there's also the theory that when you promote from within, you get, and to Steve's point, if, if the frontline folks feel they're not being listened to or supported, what better way than to take someone that's there and put them up and, and have them. Absolutely, that's an option. Uh, and I that's actually, maybe another way. I actually heard his comment, not the issue of recruiting from central office into, the, into those positions, but the backward, taking superintendents who had been disciplined and who were a problem into, and putting them into central office. So it, that, that was the, that, so, um, Chris, did you have a question? Or are you no, just, just twiddling your thumb? Um, was waiting for my turn. Um, the thing I was thinking about was what we just went through with uh, guard and the new yeah. general, where it, they had a real challenge to address and sort of a culture change. And, and I'm just looking at that as maybe a model that we want to consider. What we what happened in the last four years there, and how because it seems as though that they're on the right track in a way. They, they are, the, the main difference is that the people that are in the, the guard that they're talking about are there because they want to be there. The people who are incarcerated are not there because they want to be there, So, it, and they're, they're confined in this space so that some of the leadership issues can be the same. I think but about the employees, not the... Right, I'm talking about employees and leadership, and right. you know, like where did, uh, the new AG come from? What was his relationship to the people that he's now in charge of managing? So to, to he was, yeah, community. he was he there. Come from entirely outside, yeah. he knew firsthand about things, but he was responsible yeah, he, yeah. to yeah. that. And he came, and, and he's improving the culture. I mean, that's clearly yes. he's beginning right. to affect. Got it. That whole, all that stuff, the message from the top down. So now, if I could ask Steve a question. Um, and take all this other stuff that we've been talking about, the lack of feeling supported and the leadership challenges, but overtime still seems to be a big issue for massive day-to-day, -day, God, i got to get up and do this again. 
if we could find the 30 people that we had talked about at one point, does that is that enough to relieve a system-wide overload in terms of overtime? I mean, how many people do we need? I heard the other day, I'm not sure what, what the current number is that the commissioner had. Somebody told me, somebody who works in, the, in, the, in corrections, told me there are 68 vacant positions in oh. corrections right now. And that's before the 15 positions. So there's going to be, a, in budget adjustment, there's going to be 15 positions well, from last year um, uh, added to that number. Well, and we've given them 30 in the budget, FY20, yeah. so which the should not be filled. Administration asked for another year to fill those positions. And the, the, I think the deal that's been struck between the two appropriations committees is that they'll do 15 this year, but the, the commissioner can't sweep those positions. So, so why can't we why can't we fill them? Do, do we need to have different qualifications? Do we need to have different recruitment, which Beth was talking about? Um, do we need to have, uh, why can't we fill those positions? I think it's a variety of reasons. Yeah. All um, of what you're talking about. The biggest thing that I will tell you that I think does hurt, and I heard this just yesterday, and I've heard it over and over again from people who've been there a long time, is that current employees will tell new potential employees not to, not to do it. And well, that's kind of biting off their nose to yeah. spite their face. Well, they'll do it. They'll just Isn't be quite it? honest with them, and they'll I, say, you, you have a young family. You'll never see your kids. You'll be asked to work on godly amounts of overtime. No one's going to listen to you, and you're going to you're going to be in a, in, a, in a pressure cooker with very violent offenders. So that's the biggest problem. If you want to fix recruitment, you have to create an atmosphere where the people who work there will say, "This is a great place to work, right. and you can make a career of this." And it's and I understand what you're saying. But it's like a cycle. It does. You're not going to do that until you have more employees, because they're still going to have to work the overtime until you have more employees. It's absolutely true, and but I think in good conscience, if somebody asks them, "What do you answer honestly? Like, how do you feel about yeah. it?" They'll say, "If you want to stay married, and if you want to uh, see your kids, this is not the job for you." So, and if many look at the national statistics that the federal government just did. Or, uh, and I, I'm looking for this actual data. Um, just did a just did a report that shows what the suicide rate is among correctional officers. Right. Life expectancy, they're expected to live 18 months after they retire and they die at age 56. <laughs> so that's the other thing, is we're not adequately supporting the people who are there. You know, they see some very crazy things mm. and they put up with a lot. Yeah. And I think that has an effect on that. So training and support, training ongoing, support, everyday support. Inclusion in decisions. Um, and I think, you know, I'm a little jaded because I was just in this meeting yesterday, but the pop, we've got to get control of politics. I mean, politics is everywhere, but it is very political. And people are aware of that. You mean the, the facilities or the? Department, the facilities, the central office. It's very political. And it's, it's and do you, um, by political, do you mean cronyism, nepotism? Yes. Um, what do you mean by political? I think people feel like if management likes you, uh, management will reward you, and if management doesn't like you, they'll come after you. Oh. And, well, and, I, you know, I don't think that that is political. But I mean, that's, I mean, that's, maybe yeah. it's not the right term, but you know, we did have, I'll give an example. So Southern State's a good example. I don't mean to keep just picking on them just a few superintendents ago, you know, we had a situation there where there was a superintendent who had a team. Are you on my team? Yeah. And if you're on his team, you got treated really well. And if you're not on his team, yeah. you didn't get the promotion, you didn't get, you know, anything you were looking for. And we pushed really hard to get that guy out of there. Fortunately, at some point, central office interests and DSEA's interests merged. We both wanted him out of there. And he got, he was out. But that's a good example. Of okay, yeah. You know, politics so, maybe isn't the right term, but. So I hate to, I don't want to end this conversation, but I'm just going to, just because we have. Big I don't want to die. <laughs> we don't want you to die in die, here. Okay, talking. go out there and die. <laughs> yes. okay. To get the turnover rate for superintendents. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, we should probably be able to get that for superintendents. Yeah. I do also look at while Steve was talking, there were 60 vacancies, vacant positions in the Department of Corrections as of June 30, 2019. Okay. So, so the, the reason I'm going to is because Betsy has to leave us at 3. 
and she's here for another. Um, I do. I have a couple of just, just like two one sentence things. Yes, yeah. and no questions. Right. This is just um, just updating you. Uh, Secretary Smith is, is hiring a law firm or consultant to um, do a full review of the um, Chittenden County Correctional Facility and other cultural things across. So that is well underway. The um, firm has been engaged and um, we're working for them to provide the documents that they need to do their work. Um, and then we are working with the Agency of Human Services Secretary on recruitment for the permanent uh, uh, superintendent. So that's just starting and hopefully we'll be posting that job pretty soon. So and they the, are- the, the commissioner? The commissioner. So they are looking at a national search and they really want to oh. cast that net wide and hopefully, um, you know, they'll be somebody that is actually interested in doing that job. I mean, as uh, Steve said, that any job in the Department of Corrections is very difficult and there's burnout and there's burnout at all levels at the superintendent level as well, so at the management level as well. So it's not just it's not just the rank and file employees, it's all employees and I think that that's because it's really, really difficult work. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. So we're we're gonna put this on again for um, hopefully we can have some some concrete things that we can begin to look at it. And if anybody has uh, any interest, look at the uh, justice reinvestment because some of this is kind of happening. Because some of the changes that will be made in the in this corrections and judicial system will also impact employees. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, we have it. I will tell you when we're going to look at it. We're going to look at it next Wednesday at 3.15. There's much to, to, I can share with you about measures we're taking. Yeah. And oh, good. Recruitment and retention. Good. And, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Master. Sorry if this is a discombobulated conversation. No, it's, it's good. I just I wish I could keep going with that. Sorry, I keep getting up. <laughs> just, I think I'll make it. Yeah, just don't die in here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you got my dear? Thank you. <clears throat> Betsy, I wrote, um, I see Paul has given us some language. I also wrote to Betsy this morning and gave her my language. So if you want to sure. share that. And, and I uh, apologize, it was really rough language that I gave you that was I bet she was on the face. <laughs> so so what so, so yesterday um, we we pulled this bill back because there were some suggestions about uh, some other things that we might ask the the commission to look at and come back to us with and we wanted to be um, a little more directive mm -hmm. to them. So this is what we came up. This is what I what I gleaned out of our conversation. Good. For the record, Betsy, the Interest Legislative Council reviewing with you draft number 1.1, a potential amendment to S198, which is an act relating to an enforceable state code of ethics. Um, this bill is introduced has several sections. The first one is just a purpose and intent section, that being to um, require the commission to propose an enforceable state code of ethics and the intent being that the General Assembly intends to consider it and enact one into law next biennium. Section two of the bill is introduced contains the proposal language. Section three contains the uh, year extension of the commission's funding source, and then section four is the effective date. Um, this potential amendment would only be a new section two about what the proposal would need to contain. And um, this is not edited yet, and I uh, may have more revisions for me, and whenever you have a final version, I can run it over to the editors. Um, but what you have in front of you here is um, Madam Chair, based on your notes that you uh, provided to me earlier today. So this language would say for specifically the commission's proposal for an enforceable state code of ethics, it would require the commission to work with all three branches, including the Office of the Secretary of State, 
and with advocacy groups and the public for the commission to propose to the General Assembly for statutory enactment a state code of ethics that would cover all three branches of state government, including exempt and statewide office holders. Subdivision A2 says also working with those groups, the commission would also need to recommend options for enforcement and implementation of that proposed state code of ethics. And subsection B is the deadline to make that proposal to the two gov office committees, uh, being the date provided in the bill is introduced, which is November 15, 2020. And, and I'll just tell you why I put that, that second. The first one, because we assumed that the, the commission would be working with all those people anyway, and we didn't need to tell them, but thought it doesn't hurt to tell them mm -hmm. to make sure to work with all those people and to make sure that it covers everyone. And then the second, the two that I put in there was instead of being specific about what they, the issues that they should look at, and it, assuming any kind of um, conclusions that they came to was just recommend options for uh, enforcement and implementation. So those options could, be, and they could say, we think it should be implemented and enforced just exactly like it is now, or we think that there should be a fully um, funded commission that has investigators and police and, you know, I mean, they will come up with some recommendations to us for the implementation and enforcement. The one thing I'll note, just Madam Chair, that differs from the bill as introduced is this proposal would uh, bring in the judicial branch, and I do. Yeah, think, I wasn't sure yeah. if we. I, I, I think I, there would be constitutional yeah. concerns with that because the Supreme Court has exclusive yeah. disciplinary authority over the judges. Um, and it has its own judicial rules of conduct. So I, I would anticipate that the judicial branch would express concern. Okay. I, I, I wasn't too sure. But, so what? But that's just the judges. Uh, I, no, they, the whole no, staff, the whole, the two, they only look at the judges. They are not looking at the staff. Um, the Supreme Court also has, by the Constitution, administrative control yes. over the judicial branch. And yes. so I think if you do want to pursue this to be applied to the judicial branch, I would think you'd want to hear from at least the court administrator on the judicial branch's perspective on being wrapped in potentially yeah. to an enforceable state code of ethics. Yeah. Well, this goes to our discussion yesterday where we said if we had a base state code of ethics that everybody engaged with and owned, each area, each branch could have an additional overlay just like we allow municipalities to have more regulation, but we set a statutory minimum that they can't have less of. So why couldn't it be con work constructively together to establish that and be let them because, do something additional? Because in the Constitution, it says the Supreme Court shall have administrative control of all the courts of the state and disciplinary authority concerning all judicial offices and attorneys at law in the state. So the only thing that controls the legislative branch is a constitutional provision. That's why you can control municipalities, because you do have statutory authority over them. What I'm expressing here is that I right. have a feeling that the legislative branch does not have statutory authority to enact a code that would control the judicial yes. branch. Got it. And, and for the legislative branch, and we didn't put this in here, but it's for non-core responsibilities only. And we didn't put that in here, but I don't know if you want to put it, because um, it would cover the, the two branches. <laughs> and, um, but for legislators, it only covers non-core responsibilities. And that was clear in 198. Yeah. Mean, meaning voting. It doesn't cover. Right. And I don't know if you, it's necessary to put that in or. I think it's up to you how you'd want to phrase it. Um, whenever that proposal did come back to the General Assembly, we could have further conversations about what the commission, from a constitutional perspective, could have ability to regulate as it re relates to the legislative branch. I would prefer to see it in there. Making it clear. Yeah. Just because it would Anticipating help. question. Yes. Okay. But we're keeping well, Secretary of State. 
would also mean that he didn't go investigate all the non core stuff, I mean, all the core stuff, and then right. and present something that and we say, well, that's not right. what we want you to do. Right. And we're keeping secretaries. Well, it's just working right. with them. This, this doesn't yeah. this this including the secretary. Okay. I mean, they would be, the commission would work with the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the Secretary of State and advocacy groups and the public. Yeah, well, this goes to my hope that we would be more explicit about our ownership and create opportunities for us to, as legislators, to engage in this work during the course of the fall. Well, anybody can do that. Betsy, why does it say including exempt and statewide office holders? What do you, I mean, I know what exempt means, but why does it say exempt there? Because I put it there. <laughs> well, did we not think they would? This means exempt employees, right? Yes. Okay. Were they not covered before? I'm just confused as to why that has to be. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just wondering I, why it has to I be. I just wanted to make it clear that it applied to statewide office holders. And if exempt employees are are considered executive branch employees that would be covered under here, we don't need the word exempt in there. But I think we do need state, statewide office yeah, holders. Yeah, I, I do, the statewide office okay. holders. Okay. We sure. can take out exempt. I'm I, don't, sure. I don't care. And then I have a broader question, um, or not broader, but. I'm looking at what Betsy brought us, I'm looking at what Paul Burns brought us, and I'm just wondering whether there's a way to mesh them. They don't seem in some ways that far apart. There's it's different, different language, but I mean, the first one seems taken care of. Mm -hmm. The second one, a report outlining codes of enforcement powers, is sort of applied because it says recommend options for enforcement and implementation. Public transparency mm -hmm. could be integrated into the, the number two. Into the implementation, right? I just want you know. Yeah. Does that make sense? Can we try to do that? I. I mean, I'm looking at you, but I know it's sense. <laughs> <these folks. laughs> you could probably do it language-wise. Yeah. I don't know that we need to put in a transparency plan, a public transparency plan. That should be part of the implementation. How they're going to implement it. I would think. Okay. Paul, do you want to weigh in? Uh, for the record, Paul Burns, Executive Director of VPER. Um, so I had not seen your draft, yeah. uh, Madam Chair. Well, I just made it up at 11. <laughs> <laughs> well, me too. But, uh, but, but I think they are uh, largely overlapping in interest. So I appreciate that. And I think, though, the language is a little bit different in several points. I, I wouldn't quibble with that. I, I, I think the language that you have for subsection you know, one and two is fine. I put in potential costs. If you don't want them to make an estimate of costs, that's, it's not the most important thing for me, but I think that will be a question that would yeah. come, obviously. Yeah. Um, and then the third point was just one, it, it is, it would be a demonstration of, um, of a commitment on your part for public transparency for certain of these proceedings, like when a violation has been found, you think that should be public. It's, it's not drop dead requirement for me, and certainly we're gonna press for that kind of thing. Um, I, I don't know, um, that, that's the one thing that's kind of not in, uh, in your proposal. And then the, this is the last one, and I'll, I'll be quiet, but is uh, you mentioned an opportunity for the public to be engaged, and I think that's probably fine, as is I just wanna make sure that there would be an opportunity, not necessarily for a public hearing, but for public comments to be given, and I think that's basically uh, implicit in the language that you suggested, so that's fine with me. So we're largely there, it, that transparency would be the question. My, my comment about that would be that that would be part of the, the option for implementation and enforcement, and I, I am not sure, I think that by putting that in, you are raising so many red flags, uh, because if it, I, I, first of all, I don't know if I agree that every time there's a violation, it should be public. I, I don't know that, because I don't know what kinds of violations there might be that are confidential or shouldn't be public. So I'm, I'm not going to. Right. I, I and until it's that. adjudicated and you know that it's actually been a violation. Well, even, yeah. even if there has been found to be a violation, I'm not sure that all violations should be made public. So I think that would be part of the implementation re recommendation. That's my only, that's why I left that out. Could I ask why the Office of the Secretary of State is called out 
I mean, why not? It's just including. Yeah, um, but it's the only one that's called up. Well, because the, working with the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the, because because the Secretary of State's office is bull on this, right? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, I, 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 it's only because of good reason. I, mean, I don't, I don't uh, because. They're kind of part of the executive branch, but not really part of the executive branch. And so I put them in there because, um, I mean, we could have put all the statewide offices in here, but I think that the Secretary of State's office is the one that is the most concerned about this. We could have put the auditors, because they're not really part of the executive no, branch. I understand. I, I just find it prescriptive. They are, but. If, if and assume it's Larry, if whoever is, the executive director, I, I think if they're going to do their job, they'll do that. Right. Well, we can take the Secretary of State's office out and just say executive that. and legislative branches. I, I would prefer that. Okay. I'm fine with that. You have to, I, I was doing this at, yeah. um, trying to get it madly to so Betsy. and legislative. And advocacy groups in the public. Yeah. Okay. I do think it is, um, and you probably want to change, I'm sorry. Sorry, pardon, go ahead. On line 10, um, change three to two. Pardon? On line 11. On line 11. I'm sorry, 11. No. Oh, yes. If yes, you yes, want yes, to exclude yes. the judiciary. Yes. And you want to put that in there for non core legislative duties yes. someplace. I don't know where you, that goes. Sure. How do you do that? Sure. Can what? you use the language from the bills introduced and also um, be Perk's proposal? Be Perk has a new name. This is. Oh, no. No. That issue for me. Okay. <laughs> um, one thing that was interesting that was raised in uh, the perks recommendations was um, the staffing that would be necessary because I, I do think it'll be important to understand what the staffing needs will be. Like, we had a conversation about the prosecutor and who that should be, the investigator needs, um, what the, the executive director's current role, what the proposed role would be. Um, they had also requested administrative staff, whether that would be necessary, and then potential contracting with an administrative law officer for hearings, et cetera. You mean to do the enforcement? Yeah, well, but isn't that wouldn't they come back with a plan for enforcement and implementation and they'd say we need to have 13 staff members or we need to have none? I don't think, I, okay. I don't want to put in here that, okay. because that is part of how they would implement it. Sounds good. I, I think. You could argue that. I. Well, I think if you go back with it, I, I'm not opposed to putting in more words in there, but if you're coming back with the plan to implement, you're going to say, this is how we're going to implement it, this is what it's going to take right. staff-wise to implement it, so it does seem it's part of the implementation. Yeah, I think it's important. Well, but, you know, I agree. Do you agree that we should put in there they need to come back with staffing recommendations? Yes. Uh, my, that, is, that isn't what I said. You said, I said it is for enforcement and implementa implementation. Implementation impl um, implies right. staff. Are you right. The, the, the suggestion was that we put in here, including staffing and cost recommendations. Oh, I don't think you need okay. to define. Okay. I think that that's a sin. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't. Okay. Yeah. No. I was. I want. I wouldn't take out implementation. No, we're not going to take out implementation because that's like how we're going to do it. Right. But we don't need to. You don't yeah. need to be too yeah. prescriptive, as so, you would say. So we have just this scheduled again. We thought we were done, but we have it scheduled again for. When do we have it scheduled for next? Uh, is it Thursday? Is it this Thursday? No. Today is Thursday. Oh, today is Thursday. Uh, We have it scheduled for some time. Anthony. Oh, I know when Thursday we have it scheduled. Three. Uh, Thursday is local government day. Oh, right. Oh. And what we thought we would do is sometimes, you know, we go up on the floor there, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes the they keep us up there for many hours because they have so much to throw at us. I don't think there will be that much this year. I don't think there's that much controversy that they have with us this year. So what we thought is after, if we get done up there in a reasonable time, we'll come down here and finish this up. Does that? So it would be just kind of 
flexible on next Thursday. It, we might even do it in front of them. Well, the House Committee will be there also, but uh, those could, people. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, that fabulous group. Oh, no, wait right until I tell house. you about my dream. Did I, t I didn't tell you about my dream yet about House members. Anyway, okay. Our partners uh, in the house. I'm actually will be I'm a little and treasure. What? I really thought we were going to put this out as the first bill that came out without any amendments. So I'm a I know. I know. I know. Us. I, so you are the reason. So are the reason. May I ask yes. why? If we're taking it back into committee, Betsy Ann. If we're taking this back, into we didn't. Why were? Okay. So, I'm sorry. Sorry. I thought we took it back into committee. Yes. So I don't understand why we have to do it as an amendment. We don't. Okay, so let's not. No, let's okay. just do it as a. Let's a, just incorporate it. Let's just do it as a strike, strike call and do right. a new bill. Exactly. Okay. Because we don't want the we don't want the original language in there if it conflicts with this language. Yes, exactly. I would rather have yeah. a clean bill and it does yeah. it confuses everybody. Okay. Yeah. So you would just want to strike yeah. all yeah. the okay. Thank you. That yeah. was my point. Sounds good. So you oh, want yeah. to maintain the the purpose and intent section yeah. in one. Yes. And the extension of the uh, funding yes. source. So yeah. that there will be a bill without amendments. What's that? What's that? Does yes. That mean, well, it'll it'll be to being a bill a without any amendments. But it will be an amendment to the original. Right. But nobody's going to know that except us. No, they <laughs> will know it's there because you have to say, can I speak to the bill? It isn't very transparent. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> transparent? You can speak and introduce it as you know. OK. May we thank you, Betsy. Thank good. you. OK. Thank you. Huh? Are we do we have a minute break so we can get some tea? If we have if we can be back here in three minutes. Okay. But that means we have to leave right away and get the tea water and get back here. And I do not have to leave, so okay. it's been restricted. Okay. No. Allison, don't talk. Yeah. No. <laughs> yes. It's impossible. <laughs>